Our topic tonight is China's foreign policy since the uh, financial crisis. Um, I don't know what goes through the minds of everyone when they hear that title, but there are endless number of themes. Let me say just very quickly uh, that our guest is just extraordinarily prepared for this particular evening. Um, he's a graduate of Haverford College. Uh, he has a master's degree in uh, international relations from Penn, a uh, PhD from Columbia. And during those years that he was achieving those things, he studied and researched and, and studied language in China uh, for a period of time. Uh, presently, as you probably know, he's a senior research uh, fellow at Brookings. He's consulting with the policy planning staff at State. And in terms of practical things, he was the assistant, it was a deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for two years for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, being responsible for China, Taiwan, and uh, Mongolia. Uh, he uh, has taught at Cornell and MIT before going to Princeton, where he's now a full professor. He works in that wonderful Woodrow Wilson School. And uh, if you look at his publications, they cover almost every facet of China's foreign policy and uh, most interesting takes on them. But rather than repeat the, uh, uh, his numerous writings, uh, let me simply look forward with you to hearing what he has to say about this particular problem, its underpinnings, and then answer questions. Professor Christensen. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Um, Father, thank you very much uh, for, and to everybody for being here. And uh, thanks to uh, Ms. Norton for all of her uh, assistance on logistics. Um, I was a moving target and hard to pin down on this, and I appreciate your patience in uh, arranging this, uh, this evening. Um, I want to say a couple things about Baltimore. I uh, have a couple of personal links. Um, my mother-in-law grew up on Edgemont Avenue in a row house uh, in Baltimore, so I promised her that I would mention that. Um, uh, the other thing is I grew up playing lacrosse on Long Island, and uh, Baltimore was always that other place that played lacrosse, you know? <laughs> Um, but uh, more seriously, my, the captain of my college team at Haverford, uh, Dr. John Griffith, uh, was a fine guy. He was uh, killed in an accident a couple of years ago. So I wanted to remember him tonight and uh, think of his family. So, Okay, uh, the topic today is China's foreign relations since the financial crisis. And uh, it's a topic that is a little bit uh, difficult to pin down because it's a moving target like uh, my schedule. And uh, the, the issue really is why has China's foreign relations portfolio uh, been spoiled after many, many years of success? And that's really what's occurred uh, since the financial crisis happened. China was very, very successful from the late 1990s to about 2008 in increasing its material power at a very fast pace, but at the same time reassuring its neighbors that this newfound power was not going to pose a direct threat to their national interests. This really came to a screeching halt in the 2009 to 2010 period. And China had tense relations with the United States over issues like Taiwan arms sales, uh, the Google affair that you probably read about, uh, the P Dalai Lama's visit uh, with the president in a private capacity, uh, issues over North Korea and the South China Sea. So there was a lot of tension with the United States in that period. But what's more remarkable is China managed to systematically alienate in the year 2010 almost all of its neighbors in a 360-degree uh, fashion. Um, and these were neighbors that China had achieved quite a bit of success in reassuring uh, in that earlier decade. Um, there are many factors uh, behind what I call China's abrasive diplomacy in 2010. And fortunately, 2011 has been somewhat better. There's been a bit of a course correction. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the factors that brought about the, p the bad year of 2010 are still in place. And I'd like to discuss those factors. The common sort of punditry uh, take on these things, and the, I'm going to offer you my take today, and I'm supposed to say at the outset that uh, all these views are my own, even though I consult for the State Department. These are just my views, not the U.S. government's views. The common take in the newspapers and in, in, uh, in, in a punditry world is that China found itself to be more powerful because of the financial crisis. It did better in its recovery than the United States and the Europeans. 
and they declined in power and China's power continued to rise and therefore China changed its strategy according to its newfound power status and adopted a new grand strategy to match that newfound power status. I don't think that this is correct and I'll try to lay out why I don't think it's correct, that, that standard view. I'm going to argue that uh, this was really the result of a combination of perceptions related to China's newfound place in the, uh, following the financial oh. crisis and the domestic politics of China, uh, which from the perception of Chinese elites and many people in Chinese society is very fragile. And the financial crisis only exacerbated that fragility. Um, it is the case, I'd say first off, that many in China do see China as much stronger today than it was a few years ago in relation to the other great powers in the world. So that is a factor in people's perceptions. I don't think the top leadership has such an exaggerated view, that's my impression, that the top leadership doesn't have such an exaggerated view of China's newfound power. But in populist newspapers, in commentary, and just on the street, I've spent five months in China last year, uh, you get the sense that a lot of people feel that China's time is coming or has come and that China doesn't need to be taken anymore. It doesn't need to be pushed around anymore. This perception uh, is a factor that the Chinese leadership uh, takes seriously. Um, why does it take it seriously? Because the Chinese leadership in my opinion, seems more concerned about maintaining domestic stability in China than at any time since just after the Tiananmen crisis of 1989. Uh, I was there in the early 90s at Peking University, and they were even more concerned about domestic stability then than they are now. But at no other time in my experience, which dates back to 1987, have I seen them so concerned about domestic stability. And the financial crisis drove that home for them because they realized that they were dependent on export markets, they were dependent on the world economy in a serious way, and the world economy was not necessarily a reliable uh, source of economic stability. So in that sort of setting, they take very seriously these nationalist feelings that say our leaders should not be pushed around by outside powers anymore. And uh, not only did, uh, did China appear stronger, but the United States appeared weaker. So if you have a situation in which China is insecure at home but feels stronger abroad uh, and on a popular level, you have a situation in which the leadership is not so much adopting a new grand strategy, but it is reacting to events outside of its control in a more abrasive and robust way than it did in the past. In other words, China is not driving the train. If you look at the series of issues that came up over the last year, you see things that happened on China's periphery, they happen to rising great powers in history. They're normal accidents, normal frictions related to rising great power uh, status. But the Chinese government reacted to those uh, issues in an abrasive way that alienated many of their diplomatic partners that they had, f that they had nurtured over that earlier decade that I described. The good news is that China doesn't, in my opinion, have an aggressive new grand strategy. If it did, that would be very bad for us. The bad news is that China does not seem domestically or institutionally particularly well prepared for managing the normal frictions that come with a rising great power's status. And that is a concern. So that's the bad news. And that's something we have to take very seriously. Because as powers rise, they rub up against other countries. They don't have to be aggressive. They don't have to be revisionists. It just happens. And to be fair to China, I'm not picking on China as a nation or as a culture here. I wrote an article in 2000 with a Columbia professor, Richard Betts, in which we argued if China handles its rise to great power status as poorly as the United States did in the late 19th century, we're in big trouble. Right? You think about the Spanish-American War, right? we'd be in big trouble. So we have to hope that China does better than we did. And it's a real challenge. And the problem, again, is that China doesn't seem domestically or institutionally, in terms of the government institutions, particularly well suited to manage those normal frictions of a rising great power particularly well. So let's review 2010, the bad year. What happened? Well, there was the Google issue uh, in which the United States government expressed the standard position on, uh, on freedom of expression, freedom of the internet. 
and protection of intellectual property rights. Uh, this led to a, a fairly harsh reaction in China. Um, standard U.S. policies leading to more harsh reactions than we would otherwise expect. That's what we're going to see as a pattern here. Taiwan arms sales. The United States has sold defensive arms to Taiwan for uh, decades across administrations, but the Chinese reaction to the package that the Obama administration sold in January 2010 or announced to Congress in 2010 was harsher, arguably, uh, than previous reactions. Same goes for uh, the Dalai Lama's visit with the president in a private capacity as a religious leader, something that uh, presidents have done across uh, parties. Um, and uh, um, President Bush even uh, uh, put the Congressional Medal on the Dalai Lama uh, when I was in the government. So this is not a new policy, but the reaction was particularly harsh. I think part of this was the financial crisis and this domestic political environment that was created uh, that I described before, and part of it was a misreading of the Obama administration. In 2009, the Obama administration opened its administration in a very positive, accommodating, constructive way toward China to try to signal that this administration wasn't going to suffer from the first year uh, ills that almost every administration had suffered in China relations. It was almost always a problem in the early months of every administration, going back uh, to, uh, to, to Ronald Reagan. Um, I think many in China misread those signals as either a sign that the administration was weak in its, in its diplomacy or that the administration was simply smart and recognized that the United States was weaker than it was before and had to adopt a more accommodating position. I don't think it was intended. I think it was a misperception in China. I'm not criticizing the policies here so much as describing to you the impression that those policies created in Beijing. So when the Obama administration adopted standard U.S.-China policies in January 2010, for many observers in China, this came as a bit of a shock. It didn't come as a shock to me, and I actually support those policies. I think they're all rooted in U.S. national interests. I think they were smart to adopt them, but it came as a bit of a shock after 2009. All of this created a domestic, a heated domestic political environment related to U.S.-China relations and related to China's foreign policy more generally. Now, you add to the mix a series of accidents that China did not cause as a government, as an intentional uh, set of, uh, of facts. And one is the problems on the Korean Peninsula. <coughs> Excuse me. North Korea sinking the Chunan, a South Korean corvette with the loss of 46 sailors in March of 2010, and then shelling the island of, Yamp of Yampyang uh, in November, uh, killing four more uh, ROK uh, citizens, including two uh, military uh, personnel. The United States and the South Korean government, the ROK government, uh, responded with exercises off of Korea, including in the Yellow Sea, I think quite appropriately, uh, to these clear provocations. You might even say acts of war by the North Korea. China reacted harshly not to what North Korea did, but what the United States and the ROK did in response. This severely alienated not just Washington, but especially Seoul and Tokyo the neighbors of North Korea who saw North Korean actions as so belligerent and so dangerous to see China criticizing the United States and the, and the South Korean response seemed totally out of place. The ASEAN Regional Forum in July of 2010 uh, was attended by Secretary Clinton and at that forum she raised an innovative approach uh, toward uh, South China Sea sovereignty issues. Again, a policy series, a series of policies that I support that I think were much more sophisticated than they were portrayed in the press, but which led to a fairly harsh reaction in China. And what Secretary Clinton did is to say, we don't have any say in the sovereignty issues in the South China Sea or any maritime sovereignty issues around the world. But we have a stake in peace and stability in the South China Sea where so much of our trade and the world's trade travels. So we encourage the local actors to use multilateral confidence building measures to make sure that these sovereignty disputes don't spiral out of control into a conflict 
which would hurt everyone's interests, including America's interests. This was portrayed, even in the U.S. press, but particularly in the Chinese press, as the United States intervening in the sovereignty disputes themselves, something we didn't do. But it led to a very harsh reaction. At the, at the forum itself, um, the public reports suggest that the Chinese foreign minister, Yang Jiechi, um, didn't so much approach the United States in a tough manner, but approached the Southeast Asian states at the conference criticizing them for bringing in outside forces into the disputes in a way that alienated them. And this is a series of countries, ASEAN has 10 countries uh, on China, on, in China's neighborhood, and they alienated a bunch of them all at once. So you see even more alienation, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and of course Washington. You have uh, the Japanese fishing boat is in incident, which you probably heard about. I'm sorry, it's the Chinese fishing boat incident. It's a Japanese uh, incident uh, with a Chinese fishing boat, in which a Chinese fishing boat uh, had a collision. That's all I'll just describe it technically instead of politically. Had a collision with a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. The captain was arrested and was uh, going to be tried under domestic law in China, uh, in Japan, something that would uh, lead to a harsh Chinese reaction in almost any year because it happened in disputed territorial waters. So if you use domestic law, you're making a sovereignty claim, and that would lead. But it led to a particularly harsh reaction in this year of 2010, in September of 2010. And a ex rather extraordinary event is when the Japanese government actually backed down and did not prosecute the fishing boat captain and returned him to China. After that was done, the Chinese foreign ministry criticized Japan and demanded reparations. So this really alienated the Japanese public, and Chinese popularity fell off the scale in Japan. And Japan-China relations, you know, historically are rather tense. We saw a process here in which we saw that institutional problem that I, said, I, I cited before uh, came to the fore. China has a problem in terms of coordination of its foreign policy between various foreign policy organs. It's a very stovepiped hierarchical system, as you'd expect in a Leninist state. And you don't have a lot of communication across the civilian military divide, except at the very top. Right, so that's a, that's a running problem. And I think we have some evidence that this was a problem in the Japanese fishing, uh, in, the, uh, in the case of the US ROK exercises in particular. And I think that uh, the example would be uh, when the US and ROK exercises, the plans for them were leaked in the South Korean press the Chinese foreign ministry reacted in a negative way, but in a rather mild way. And then a general from the PLA, uh, General Ma Xiaotian, made a public statement saying that such exercises would run against our national interest. And then following that, the foreign ministry took a very strident stance. All right, so you saw this kind of interagency problem where they hadn't coordinated their messaging and of course, when a foreign ministry says one thing on one day and a harsher thing the next day, that leads to an even worse reaction than if they had just said a harsh thing on the first day, right, in terms of foreign reaction. So you see this type of process that uh, creates real problems for Chinese foreign policy. The lack of interagency coordination is marked. There's really no equivalent of the National Security Council in China that would coordinate the various uh, security and foreign policy organs. There's no uh, military expertise at the top of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the, the, the small group, the uh, nine members of the Politburo Standing Committee, who really run the country, none of them are, have military experience um, of any significance. I'm not arguing that the military is a rogue element. I don't believe that. I think there's nine members at the top control the military, but they don't have the experience or the attention span to control the entire foreign policy and security bureaucracy on, in a sustained way. And those bureaucratic elements don't communicate with each other well, and that's not a good situation. In addition to this problem, as China's power grows, it runs into fundamentally new problems that it didn't face in the recent past or even the distant past, except way, way back to the Ming Dynasty. And that is maritime disputes. China does not have a modern naval history of much note. And now China's power is growing and it's rubbing against its neighbors with whom it has maritime disputes. 
And it has anywhere from five to nine, depending on how you count them, security agencies involved in maritime security, right? not particularly well coordinated with each other. And you have very few people in the military with naval experience at a high level. And almost nobody in the country with maritime security short of using your navy, your destroyers, et cetera, this type of issue. So it's a, it's a very complex set of issues for the top leadership to manage on a good day, plus they have this lack of coordination. So there were a large number of actors involved in the foreign policy process, and those actors, for sincere reasons, can send bad signals to other countries that are confusing to other countries. They can, for cynical reasons, uh, create realities in domestic politics by planting stories or arguments in the press that serve their institutional interests. I'm not saying that this happens. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. But it's quite possible for this to happen in the current environment in which the Chinese press is opening up somewhat. And there's a kind of truncated marketplace of ideas. You can criticize the Chinese government in the Chinese press. But all the criticism tends to come from one direction. And that's the nationalist direction. The criticism tends to be we haven't stood up strongly enough against foreigners, because that's politically correct criticism. It's hard to crack citizens' heads for being super patriotic, <laughs> right? It's much more dangerous to say they're being too aggressive, we need more democracy, et cetera, et cetera. That would be a more dangerous position to take in an op-ed. Right? So these different institutions can plant stories. They have hawkish elements within them, and they can make arguments in the press that stir up uh, uh, popular reactions about how the Chinese government ought to respond to these uh, normal accidents of a rising great power. They can also create facts on the ground. If we look at the Libya uh, uh, situation, China had as many as 30,000 citizens in Libya because Chinese companies, state-owned enterprises, had invested there and sent people over there. They hadn't coordinated with the Chinese security agencies, and then they got in trouble. And the Chinese Navy, to its credit, it did a, it, apparently quite a good job. But it had to scramble without any previous preparation to get those people out. And it was a real test. These are the types of things that are going to happen more and more as China's footprint grows around the world. And these are the types of things that demand the kind of interagency coordination at the White House, the kind of coordination uh, that the father's fine brother was involved in in the 1970s at the National Security Council, where the various elements, the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, uh, border control, customs, all these people can get together and talk about how to handle these issues and come up with plans in advance. That's what China really needs in a sense. There's also the issue of decision making and implementation, which is a kind of a political science wonky thing to raise, but it's an important distinction. You can have top leaders making very rational decisions in the national interest from their perspective that don't particularly seem radical on the face of it. But when they're implemented at the local level by officials, they may be implemented in a way that the top leaders never intended, particularly if the top leaders have no experience, as in an issue like maritime security. And then you get facts created on the ground, where there's a conflict with a Vietnamese ship where there's a crash between a Chinese fishing boat and a Japanese Coast Guard ship. And then the top leadership has to react, and the top leadership has to react in, with, it, with, with the public image in the back of their mind. Why? Because they don't have a sense of strong domestic security. Why are these nationalist issues so important to them? This is my impression, right, having studied the country for quite a while. My, my impression is that nationalist issues are considered particularly dangerous to party legitimacy in China. Because the party has been very successful in one aspect of domestic security. And that is, while there are many, many protests against the state in China, by official statistics, there are upwards of 100,000 a year. Uh, uh, we want to call them riots, small protests, uh, violent acts against the state at various places. But the Chinese government has been very successful in keeping those protests local, blaming the protests on local officials, and having the central government be the white knight that comes in and corrects the problem. 
So you're mad at the state in a sense, but you're mad at the local version of the state. What nationalist issues and nationalist humiliation pose for the party as a corporate whole is an opportunity for all those people who are upset at the state for other reason to rally around a single national cause. It may not even be sincere. It may not be Taiwan that gets them out of bed to go to the protest. It may be because someone stole money from them, took their farmland. But it provides a politically correct reason to unify with other protesters in other places. And, and this is the kicker, the Chinese government has been very successful at keeping protesters out of the party itself. And on national humiliation grounds, they could actually find elements of the military or the party who are sympathetic with the complaints of the protesters that the government hasn't been strong enough and strident enough in its response. So that's why I think it's particularly dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party to lose face on these nationalist sovereignty issues. And particularly in a time when they're concerned about security, I think it helps explain the rather strident response to a lot of these crises that happened in 2010. Now, I said earlier that we've seen improvements in 2011. That's good news. That's the uh, success of diplomacy. I give the Obama administration a lot of credit for sticking by its guns, not literally, that's a terrible expression actually in this, in this context. I, I, I didn't mean that as a joke. I said it and realized right away that it was not the right, uh, right, uh, right, right expression. But sticking to principle and carrying through on those consistent policies across administrations, even though I'm sure they were aware that the Chinese were going to complain, the Chinese government was going to complain when they sold arms to Taiwan, when they let uh, the Dalai Lama to visit the president. These are the right policies. They were willing to pay the cost. They, they, they stayed the course. And uh, it became uh, perhaps more normal in the US-China relationship as a result. In addition, I think they responded well uh, to, uh, to the challenges of China's abrasive reaction to those problems. And I'll, I'll describe those in a minute. But why do I say there's been an adjustment? In late 2010, there was a very famous uh, speech, statement, essay, really essay, by Dai Bingguo, who's the state counselor, who's the highest ranking person in the Chinese foreign policy establishment. Unfortunately, he's not even a Politburo member, let alone a standing committee member. So it shows you how foreign policy is not valued as much as domestic uh, affairs in the Chinese system. But he's a very influential individual. He's a very talented diplomat. I had the great privilege of interacting with him when I was in the government, when I was working for uh, Ambassador John Negroponte. Um, he wrote a, an essay about peace and development, making the argument that, no, China doesn't have an assertive new grand strategy. It's the same strategy as Deng Xiaoping, concentrate on domestic development, don't ruffle feathers unnecessarily abroad, and focus on peace and development. So I think that was a signal. Um, there are public reports that China began to put pressure on North Korea to prevent North Korea from overreacting to a South Korean exercise late 2010. This North Korea had promised to attack South Korea in response to that exercise. Uh, the public reports suggest that China put pressure on North Korea not to do so, and North Korea did not do so. So you see the kind of constructive behavior uh, uh, shifting late 2010, early 2011. There are also public reports that Chinese energy companies have foregone new energy deals in Iran uh, in 2011. So that would be constructive behavior uh, and would suggest a, a bit of a, a course correction. I think the United States and its allies, not just the Obama administration, but the United States and its allies have handled the challenge well. Um, after the somewhat rocky start that I described in 2009, uh, you saw an effort that I think was consistent with what the Bush administration was trying to do when I was in the government, which is to try to shape the choices that China makes with its growing power. We're not trying to contain China. We're trying to say, OK, you're growing, but let's move that increased power in a constructive direction that serves everyone interest, everyone's interest, including your own. Right? And I think um, the Obama administration did that by maintaining a strong US presence in East Asia, uh, strong relationships, security relationships with our allies and our other security partners in 2010 and 2011. And I've always said that I think good China policy starts in Tokyo, Seoul, Delhi, ASEAN capitals. Again, not because of containment, but the United States needs to deal with China constructively, but from a position of strength. And I think that that's what the Obama administration managed to do by reminding China 
of two things. One, when there's a problem like North Korea, we will come to you first and ask for your active cooperation in dealing with the problem. And like the Bush administration, the Obama administration did that. We want to do this together with you. North Korea is the problem. How do we deal with it together in a way that is mutually reinforcing, constructive, effective, and doesn't cause unnecessary tensions among us? But if China says no, as it did in 2010, by not only refusing to cooperate actively with the United States, but actually blocking the United States from acting and its allies from acting in the UN Security Council in a meaningful way, then the United States needs to, from a position of strength, present a different response and say, well, we have our alliances. We can coordinate more closely with South Korea. We can do exercises. And what the Obama administration did, which I think was very smart, was increase the coordination not just with South Korea, but with South Korea and Japan at the, in, at the same time. Create more trilateral cooperation between our major allies in East Asia and significantly encourage, with some success, South Korea and Japan to start talking more seriously bilaterally about security affairs because they share a lot of interests and they have a lot of history, historical baggage between them and they need to get over that. I think all of those things were not aimed at China. None of that was aimed at China. But I don't think China liked the idea that the United States and the ROK were doing uh, intensified, let's say, uh, if public reports are right, anti-submarine warfare exercises in the, in, the, in the Yellow Sea. Because they think, well, maybe that will have some negative side effects on our military modernization and our capabilities. But if that's the Chinese reaction, that's good. right? Because there's another way to handle the problem, which is for China to cooperate with the United States and its allies, as it was invited to do, in an active way, not a zero-sum way, but a positive-sum way, to solve the common problem, which is North Korean belligerence. I think the ASEAN initiatives were also constructive, again, because I think they were misportrayed in the press. If they were as they were portrayed in the press, I would be critical of them as well, but they were not. It was not the United States getting involved in taking sides in the sovereignty dispute. It was the United States and other non-disputants, including Japan, saying, we all have a stake in peace and stability. We don't want these things solved by coercion. And I think that was the appropriate approach. So I think I want to open it up to questions. I'll just say a few closing words. The goal here is to raise the costs to the Chinese for obstructionism or passivity. And we need more than China simply to be kept down. We're not trying to keep China down. We're not trying to contain China. We need China not to act abrasively every time it runs into friction with its neighbors, because it's going to run into more and more friction as its power rises. And perhaps most important, and I didn't touch upon it here, but we can talk about it in the Q&A, we need China to play a proactive, positive role to handle global problems. China is simply too large to free ride on the efforts of others to solve those problems. It has benefited, arguably, as much or more than any country with the peace and stability that has reigned since the late 1970s through the end of the Cold War. And it needs to contribute actively to security issues like nonproliferation, to environmental issues like controlling greenhouse gases, to financial stability issues like currency. It has to contribute actively, even though it has a legitimate argument that it's a developing country that's much poorer than the United States and the Europeans. That is true. But it's such a large developing country <laughs> that we simply can't afford for it to play the role of a typical developing country for a long period of time, or we're all going to sink, maybe literally. Right. So I think that that's a problem. I think we saw a China that was playing a more assertive but constructive role, which is what we want, in the 06, 08 period, not because I was in the government then. <laughs> right? I had the privilege of serving at that time. But for a range of reasons, and there was no financial crisis, the Bush administration engaged China in this spirit, saying, we want you to be a responsible stakeholder, to stand alongside us as the, and the other great powers solving these problems together. We saw in 06, 07, China putting pressure on North Korea and leading to the only progress we made in the six-party talks, which was the destruction of that tower in North Korea. And then after that, not much. We saw China almost reverse itself on Sudan Darfur in the period. I got into office in July of 06. 
China's position then, as I described it then, and I, I was sincere about it, both as an academic and as a policymaker, was terrible. China was basically preventing the world from pressuring the Bashir regime in Sudan, even though it was committing a genocide. By late 2006 and early 2007, China was pressuring Sudan to accept the three-phase three phase a non-plan for peace and stability in Darfur. And after one of our sub-dialogues with China in early 2007, China agreed to send peacekeepers to Darfur, the first non-African peacekeepers that were committed. That was a big change. Was it 180 degrees? No, because they continued to sell arms. They did other things we didn't like. But it was a big change. China seemed to be moving in the direction that not just the United States, but the Japanese, the Koreans, the Europeans, the Southeast Asians want to see China do. Be active. Be assertive. Be powerful. But use your power for good. Right? That stopped because of the factors that I described today. We need to get them back to that place. I think the domestic and institutional hurdles to getting them back to that place where they were moving in a positive direction, they weren't where we wanted them to be, but they were moving in that direction, are very, very real. And I think that's the challenge of American diplomacy toward China. I'm an academic. They invited me into government, but I still speak for too long. Um, so I'm going to stop now and take your questions. Thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was about the foreign policy relations between China and India. Like all of China's uh, relations with any large country, they're complex. Um, they, have a, they have a very rocky history, uh, including a war in 1962 over disputed territories uh, along the Tibetan-Indian uh, border. Um, those disputes, unlike almost all of China's land disputes, have not been settled. China has systematically settled its land disputes with almost all of its neighbors, except for India. Um, there's also a sort of uh, competition historically between India and China about models. Uh, the Nehru model versus the Mao model in the Cold War period, but now liberal democracy versus this planned uh, or more uh, uh, authoritarian uh, structure in terms of development. So that's, that's still there. Uh, there's a lot of talk in nationalist circles in both India and China about a struggle for power over the Indian Ocean. I think it's more talk than reality, uh, simply because of geography. The Chinese Navy is simply unable to project power in a sustained way around the Straits of Malacca into the Indian Ocean, and won't be able to for a long time. I'm not saying that can't, can't happen, but I think some of the tensions are overblown. And uh, this term, string of pearls, I believe, originated in the United States, not in China which is this uh, description of what China is trying to do by setting up port rights around the Indian Ocean. I think that was started in an American think tank, uh, not in China. And I always thought it was a bad analogy, because if you think of defense and military stuff, you don't want a string of pearls, right? <laughs> right? I always worry that my wife's string of pearls might break, right? <laughs> right? So, yes, ma'am. OK, there's two questions. One is about Central Asia and China's relationship with the Central Asian states and Russia in an organization called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has its roots in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, it developed uh, from uh, a smaller group into a larger group over time. And it, it, in the early part of this uh, century, it was named the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What it was originally is an organization designed to uh, fight uh, separatist threats or terrorist threats in all of the countries to improve economic relations among the actors and to build confidence among these post-Soviet states, China and Russia. Um, all fairly laudable goals. I think uh, I, on separatism, I don't take any position and the U.S. government wouldn't take any position on, on, on those things except if it's violent and then it's not good, right? So you don't want to have violent separatist movements. Uh, um, and. Uh, uh, you want to have peaceful reactions to peaceful uh, separatist uh, uh, um, um, desires. So uh, the terrorism piece is obviously something we share. If these countries could cooperate to prevent terrorists from uh, operating in those areas, that would be good for the United States. Economic integration between the actors or economic uh, activity between the actors, not bad. Uh, confidence building, good. We don't want to see any wars out there. So I think that there's been a lot of overblown concern in some circles in the United States about this organization, mainly because we're not in it. My own personal opinion is we don't have to be involved in everything. 
as long as it's a constructive organization, it's not aimed at us. You know, we had, I remember we had some concerns about it when I was in the government. Um, one of the concerns was that Iran was an observer. It wasn't a member. And we said, you know, if Iran becomes a member of the organization, it looks more problematic. Because why would you have an anti-terrorist organization with Iran as a member, right? <laughs> right. It's a small contradiction there, right? Um, North Korea. Can China help? Yes. Have we seen China help? Yes. Will China help? I don't know. It's, it's been more helpful in the past than it's been recently. And we need it to help if we're going to get this problem done, in my opinion, in, in, a, in a serious manner. I personally think that if North Korea develops a true nuclear arsenal, deliverable weapons, there'll be a lot of losers. But other than the North Korean people who will be the biggest losers of that proposition, I think China will be the biggest loser. Because of the reactions of the neighbors, you don't know where they're going to go. With a state like North Korea with nuclear weapons pointed at you, you don't know how they're going to react. China's going to lose face because it's stated publicly over and over again, it doesn't want to see this outcome. North Korea is largely dependent on China. So China will be blamed either explicitly or implicitly for allowing this to happen. And if Japan goes nuclear, if South Korea goes nuclear, if a future United Korea is nuclear, probably not in China's interest, even more than it's not in America's interest. So I think a lot of diplomacy, it sounds pretentious and condescending and it's not meant to be. I think a lot of diplomacy is pedagogy, not coercion. Just trying to frame the problem so that everybody understands it's in all of our interests for not North Korea not to go nuclear. It's not a particularly American obsession. And if you don't believe it, and here I can cite public reports again, there were public reports, September 2007, that some international actor destroyed a nuclear plant in Syria. Right? That's all I can say. Some international actor destroyed a nuclear plant in Syria. This nuclear plant in Syria was built with North Korean assistance. Lots of it. That was publicly stated by the U.S. government, so I'm not revealing any secrets here. Um, but notably, and a lot of people don't pay attention to this, it was in the middle of nowhere, totally divorced from any possible civilian use. No grid, no electrical grid. And I have terribly low expectations for North Korea. And I had terribly low expectations for North Korea when I went into the government. But I found out about this pretty early, before it had gotten public. And I was surprised <laughs> that they would be so irresponsible. So North Korea with nuclear weapons is a bad thing. It's a very, very bad thing. Iran with nuclear weapons, a very bad thing. For somewhat different reasons, I think, but also very bad. It's not an American obsession. It's an American national interest to try to prevent those outcomes. That's my belief. Um, the question was, what about Tibet? When we talk about border issues, what about the displacement of people in Tibet? And why don't we say much about Tibet? Um, I think it's a real issue. We do say a lot about it. I know, I mean, I don't know what more we can say about it. Um, we do uh, uh, hold uh, the Dalai Lama in a very high place uh, in our estimation and in our treatment, and I think quite appropriately so. Um, I was very glad that President Bush went to that congressional meeting and presented the, the, the medal to the Dalai Lama, um, despite very, very strong Chinese criticism. We treat the Dalai Lama like we treat the, the Tibetan issue, which is that we see it as a religious freedom issue. The United States recognizes Tibet geographically as part of the People's Republic of China. We make a positive assertion on this that we don't in the case of Taiwan and other issues. We say that we believe that Tibet, we see Tibet as part of the People's Republic of China. So we're not supporting Tibetan independence. We note that the Dalai Lama himself says he is not pursuing Tibetan independence, and the political movement that he has been affiliated with is not seeking uh, Tibetan independence, and that he eschews violence. So for the United States, when I was in the, in the government, I'm sure it's the same today, the issue was one of civil liberties and religious freedom and human rights. That the Tibetans should have a degree of autonomy in the area that they, in which they live, 
to practice their religion and their way of life. And to the degree that that is clamped down upon consistently, that is a violation of our principles and we speak up about it. So I don't think there's a lack of attention to the problem and I think the problem is framed in the correct fashion because at the end of the day, American principles are really rooted in the idea of individuals being able to uh, practice their religion freely. It's not real, we don't really have a national principle position on which groups of people should have independent nation states with sovereign borders around them and which ones shouldn't. But they should be able to practice and live in their lives without repression. So we have criticized the repression of the monks, we have cr criticized uh, the treatment of the Dalai Lama internationally, and uh, I think that's appropriate. Yes, sir. What does the future hold as the military grows stronger, becomes more significant within their situation, and they don't have the mm -hmm. civilian military cooperation to keep that thing? It's a great question. There's no doubt that the Chinese military is modernizing at a fast clip. Its military budgets by official st statistics are, are increasing even faster than the breakneck pace of their economic growth, which is quite impressive, right? So uh, the official statistics underestimate uh, the budget. Uh, they do in lots of countries, but they particularly do in China for a range of reasons I don't want to go into. But the, the growth rates, we don't really know the budget, but the growth rates are dramatic even by their own reporting. Um, and they're gaining some new wherewithal, including, you know, I mentioned before this uh, anti-ship ballistic missile. No one's ever done that before tried to hunt a moving target with a conventionally tipped ballistic missile. Uh, there was an uh, anti-satellite test uh, in January 2007 when I was in the government that really concerned a lot of countries, not just the United States. That's how I learned to say the word spacefaring, because in our, in our demarches we would say all spacefaring states are, uh, are concerned by your activity, because it created a tremendous amount of debris uh, in low Earth orbit. It also concerned people because of the military potential and the, and the other potential in the future. So there's a real concern about the, the rise of military power. Can I imagine a situation in which the military becomes more independent of the party politically and can assert itself in ways that the party can't control? Yeah, I can imagine that. I just don't think we're there. The party structure is very, very well organized. And everybody's a party member. The judges are party members. The officers are party members. The, the civilian leaders are party members. And it's a very hierarchical organization. And the Central Military Commission sits on top of the military. And Hu Jintao, the civilian president, is at the top of that commission. So I don't have any doubt that if President Hu and the other civilians wanted to either order the military to do something it didn't want to do, or order the military to stop doing something it wanted to do, that that would occur. My concern is more subtle, which is if they lack the experience and they don't have constant military staffing for their decision-making process, they may order the military to do something without knowing what those results are. I'll give you an example from American history. John Kennedy, a Navy officer with a lot more Navy experience than any Chinese leader, ordered a quarantine of Cuba. He was shocked to discover that the U.S. Navy was dropping depth charges on, China, on Soviet submarines. He said, who ordered you to do that? Right. He said, well, that's what we do, sir. <laughs> you ordered a quarantine. It was violating the quarantine. Standard operating procedure. So this is, and this was a, a Navy officer who was the president, right? So you can imagine these types, those are the problems that I think are more likely. You can also imagine generals causing trouble, they might for budgetary reasons or for nationalist reasons, planting a story in the press saying we must stand firm on these exercises, thus creating a heated political environment in which the civilians have to operate. But I, I don't see a situation any time in the near future in which the military says, all right, we're not listening to you clowns anymore and we're going to do it our way. I just don't see that. That's, that's probably a good thing. You know, you don't want to have rogue militaries with the kind of capabilities that the Chinese military has. But it doesn't solve all the problems. That's my point. How do you see the United States and China cooperating or not cooperating on global warming? I'm going to quote someone who's much more influential than I, but I can't say who it is because the meeting was off the record. This person said, the United States and China cooperate on global warming every day. We cooperate to produce more of it. 
<laughs> it's probably our highest level of cooperation. Um, so that's my starting point. Um, I think both countries need to do a lot better. That's my own opinion. And I think that it's very, very difficult in diplomacy for the United States to effectively push countries to do better when we can't get our domestic house in order on the, on the issue. That's my own opinion. I'm an independent. I just destroyed my ability to uh, work with Republicans, I guess. But um, <laughs> you've got to say what you think when you're a professor, and I do. Um, I think we need to do better at home, and that will give us much more leverage abroad. I think we need to convince the Chinese that for us to do better at home, they need to do better as well. Because one of the complaints domestically about doing better in the United States is that China would be free riding on our efforts. So just if, if it's true that we cooperate to produce global warming, we can cooperate together to try to crack through some of the, the log jams that prevent us from doing more together. Because if one of us tries to go without the other, there's going to be accusations that we're being exploited. And that's going to make it even harder to move forward. So um, yes, sir. 1980s, there's a lot of things about the 1980s that are interesting. Um, I, you know, I was in college in the early 1980s. It was the first time I started thinking about politics. I'm the first generation of my family to, to, to go to college. Um, and it was a great experience for me. Uh, and I can remember at the time that's a lot of hubbub about uh, Japan surpassing the United States and the decline of the United States. I remember Professor Paul Kennedy's famous book uh, in that period in the mid 80s. Um, I never really bought it at the time, to my credit. You know, I don't want to pat myself on the back. I never really bought it. I was a, a person that I was raised in part by a Japanese woman. My mother died when I was quite young, and we had a Japanese nanny in our house. And uh, um, so I was very sensitive to a lot of the uh, uh, sort of anti-Japanese rhetoric in the United States at the time. And um, particularly in the auto industry, there was a lot of anti-Japanese uh, rhetoric. And there was a poor Chinese uh, immigrant who was killed in Detroit, who was mistaken for a Japanese uh, by some laid off workers. So I was kind of sensitive to those issues at the time. But on a geostrategic level, I never really bought the argument that Japan was going to surpass the United States. I never really worried about Japan purchasing real estate like Rockefeller Center. Uh, I come from a construction family. It seemed like a bad purchase anyway. Um, <laughs> um, and it turned out to be. Um, but I, I, th I, you know, the good thing is Japan did invest in the United States and produced a lot of jobs. There's a tremendous amount of sensitivity about international economic interaction that I will never understand. There are lots of Americans, in many cases, in many polls, a majority of Americans who think trade is bad for the United States, which is just, from an intellectual point of view, mind-boggling for, any, for anybody to argue that trade is bad for the United States. Foreign investment sh should be even less sensitive. Because if the argument is that by trading we export jobs, which I think is wrong, but that's the, that's the argument. By inviting investment in, we should be importing jobs. And in fact, that part's right. So Japan bought a bunch of car factories. They build more Toyotas, my understanding is, that are sold in the United States here than they do in Japan these days. So you have a lot of American workers working for Japanese companies. What's wrong with that? And you'll note that the people who complained in the 80s about Japanese behavior were not the congressional representatives who had the Japanese factory, <laughs> right? Because they were, they were helping them get reelected. So I hope that China does that kind of greenfield investment in the United States. And I hope that we have the national backbone to realize that this is not a threat to us, but an opportunity to build stronger links with China, to reduce the incentives for conflict, and to be frank, to produce American jobs, which we happen to need. Right? So I, you know, I hope that we can, we can get over some of those concerns. There are aspects of China's economic policy that are concerning to us, and we express that. The currency is undervalued by almost any economist's measure. How much is debatable. Uh, this isn't bad for the reasons that American uh, commentators often cite. It's not bad because it allows Chinese cheap products to steal American jobs. Most of the products made in China that we purchase are not going to be made here if they're not made in China. They're going to be made in Indonesia, India, or somewhere else. Those jobs aren't coming back. It's globalization. What it, where it matters is American exporters to China. Our products are artificially expensive in China because of their undervalued currency. And it's never stated that way, or hardly ever stated that way, by politicians. Because politicians want to point to the laid-off worker 
very emotionally appealing. They don't want to talk about the foregone benefits of increased American exports, the worker who doesn't yet have a job. But that's really where, intellectually, where the issue is. And it's real. There's more and more nationalism in the Chinese economy protecting Chinese firms against competition, and American businesses have spoken up about it. So there are real issues. But I hope that our kind of nationalist reaction, particularly in a financially difficult time, an economically difficult time, doesn't take the form that it did in some circles in the United States when Japan was doing well. And it turned out that Japan wasn't a threat. And it actually, when Japan's economy did poorly, it was bad for us. And if China's economy were to go south, God forbid, it would be bad for the Chinese people, obviously, hundreds of millions of whom were pulled out of abject poverty in the reform period. I didn't say that tonight, and I really want to emphasize that. There's been a massive historic success in China in this reform period. Hundreds of millions of people pulled out of poverty. When I say poverty, one dollar a day poverty. Right? If that happened, if China's economy went south, it would be a humanitarian disaster for the world. But on a selfish level, it would be bad for America's economy. We're in the same game. We have to accept that. And we have to work together to make things work better for all of us. I promised this gentleman here a question. The question is about domestic instability in China, uh, the role of uh, massive migration into the cities, which is uh, unprecedented in history. The, num the urbanization of China is unprecedented in history. Um, issues like uh, minorities along the peripheral areas of China, like in Xinjiang province, I gather you're referring to uh, Muslim minorities. Excuse me, issues like the bullet train crashing uh, with loss of life. Um, there are a lot of these issues are related in that, in many ways, despite the strength of the Chinese state in preventing independent organizations from forming to challenge the state, which they appear to be quite good at, uh, repressing independent political movements, it, the state lacks a lot of central capacity. Um, it lacks a lot of capacity to manage the social movements that are happening uh, in a massive scale because of that economic success that I described before, pulling hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, creates massive dislocation. They're particularly poor at managing those things. Maybe not the worst in the world, but they're not as good as their economic performance demands uh, at managing those things. In terms of things like the bullet train, there's a lot of corruption in China, and there's very, very little oversight. If we look at the environmental issue, if we really want China to cooperate on the environment, it's not just a question of getting the central government to be willing to do it. It's trying to imagine a central government with the capacity to enforce at the local level regulations that would reduce greenhouse gases. Very, very difficult, particularly in a system in which the party promotion system <coughs> emphasizes jobs, jobs, jobs. So if you want to get ahead in the party, you want to produce jobs, you don't want to worry about the environment. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's a big challenge, and, and I think that there was a real outrage, not so much over the crash of the high-speed train, but what appeared to many people to be a cover-up. And the cover-up's always worse. It's true in every country, right? The cover-up's always worse than the initial issue, um, which is another reason to tell the truth. I'll close on that uh, note, I guess.